Welcome to the German Marshall Fund of the United States. My name is Heather Conley, I'm president, and it is my honor to welcome you to our event today, US-Europe Cooperation in the Indo-Pacific, an event that's organized by the GMF's Asia Program. Of course, uh, diving into the Biden administration's Indo-Pacific strategy is timely and important, but I think we also have to recognize the extraordinary moment that we are living in right now. The fact that there is a major land war in Europe not seen since the Second World War, that despite the unprovoked and unjustified uh, aggression by Russia into Ukraine, we have seen enormous resolve by the Ukrainian people and the, and the Ukrainian government. And in turn, in response to that courage, we are seeing the transformation of European policy towards this conflict, whether it's German policy that now for the first time is openly embracing sending military and defensive equipment to Ukraine, changing in, in many ways thoughts about uh, spending 2% of its GDP on defense spending, immediately increasing its defensive posture, changing its energy posture vis-a-vis -vis Russia. We see the European Union following suit, implementing uh, sanctions uh, against Russian banks on, on SWIFT. We are seeing uh, an, an immediate sale of defensive equipment to Ukraine, banning Russian aircraft from EU airspace, and the list goes on. I say this because we are witnessing a transformation of European policy and we are seeing the dramatic enhancement of the transatlantic policy towards this crisis. But this is not just a transatlantic endeavor. We now see our trans-Pacific partners joining uh, with the United States, with the European Union against this unprovoked aggression. This is an important point to make. So now we turn to the conversation today, uh, focusing on uh, the Indo-Pacific strategy of the United States and understanding how our EU partners are engaging with us in that strategy. This new strategy does seek to build bridges between the Euro-Atlantic and Asia. It stresses the importance of European engagement in the region and encourages increased interaction among its Asian and European partners. Of course, this all uh, echoes uh, the long-standing mission of GMF's uh, Asia program. And so we are particularly pleased to have such distinguished guests joining us. So today's program will begin with a fireside chat with Kurt Campbell, Deputy Assistant to the President and Coordinator for Indo-Pacific Affairs at the US National Security Council. We are also joined by Gunnar Vegan, Managing Director for Asia and the Pacific at the European External Action Service. And of course, with our very own Bonnie Glazer, director of the GMF Asia program. This conversation will focus on the Indo-Pacific strategy and the role it envisions for the European Union. After the fireside chat, a second panel will explore potential areas of collaboration as well as specific plans to implement these strategies. This is such an important geostrategic moment for the United States, for Europe, for our Indo-Pacific partners. I am so excited about this program and bringing forward our distinguished speakers. So without further ado, I will turn the floor over to Bonnie Glazer. Thank you so much. Thank you, Heather, and uh, thanks to all of our listeners and viewers uh, for joining us today. It's really a privilege to have with us both Kurt Campbell and Gunnar Vegan. Uh, to talk about the Indo-Pacific strategies, our respective strategies in Europe and the United States, and about the implications of the war in Europe uh, for Asia. So why don't I start there, Kurt? Um, uh, the, we know that uh, there has been a good co cooperation between uh, the EU and the United States on the imposition of, of export controls and, and other sanctions, and there's so much attention to how uh, Europe is handling this situation. But how Asia views this and the war that is unfolding is so important uh, for both uh, the US and Europe. So can you start by talking about what Asia's response has been and, and, and why they've responded the way they have? Bonnie. Thank you very much. Let me just first uh, just take a moment 
to thank Heather. I want to commend the work of the German Marshall Fund, particularly now, the, your mission, the mission that the institution is doing, helping us understand and interpret events, not just taking place in Europe, but the synergies that we're seeing between Europe and Asia, uh, extraordinarily important. So I thank you. It's an honor to be with you this morning. And it's always great any day you get to spend time with Gunnar. So thank you for all of that. I would just say that it, it is only natural to focus, Bonnie, on the drama that is playing out in the diplomacy, largely in Europe, with the United States and with Ukraine, where you know, every morning we're riveted by stories of you know, people calling into meetings and just you know, uh, historic decisions taken uh, thereafter. I think a story that has yet to be written in its totality because it's still playing out is the um, how the developments in Ukraine have synergized uh, a set of extraordinary responses across Asia. And it speaks to the links that you just described, Bonnie, that we're seeing, and as Heather uh, mentioned, between uh, partners and allies in Europe, and then uh, uh, the same grouping of partners, allies, and friends in the Indo-Pacific. So what we've seen in just the last little while are a number of things, and I'll just go through them. First, in terms of allied solidarity, uh, the support from many countries in Asia for uh, energy uh, support during this period. So natural gas swaps, we've seen those have been written about. Um, these are inventive, important, and they are designed to help Western Europe get through a potentially difficult period uh, here in the last months of, of winter. We've also seen almost uh, all of our Asian partners come on board with the series of G7 and other sanctions associated with uh, leadership and investments. We've also seen uh, Japan and Australia step forward on, in an unprecedented way with respect to SWIFT uh, uh, designations following uh, the dramatic developments over the weekend between the United States and Europe. And we've also seen, um, uh, you know, countries, particularly in Northeast Asia, taking careful steps on technology. We have not really um, spoken very much about this, but the kinds of steps that the technology producers in Northeast Asia have taken um, are as significant in their realm as the financial steps uh, in theirs. And then lastly, you know, uh, countries stepping up to provide armed assistance. So in an unprecedented way, Australia, has decided that it will provide uh, uh, military assistance directly uh, to uh, the Ukrainians. This, the totality of this picture is one of increased connectivity and solidarity in a way that frankly, I think we can all be hopeful and pleased about as we go forward. Thank you, Kurt. Um, I, I want to turn uh, to Gunnar and ask you your uh, your sense as to what the what the, what are the lessons of what is taking place in Ukraine uh, for Europe and for our alliance as they pertain to the Indo-Pacific? You know, we've heard uh, some people advocate that Europe focus more on its on its own neighborhood, uh, that the Indo-Pacific is very far away. I, of course, disagree with that. I'm guessing you do. But I'd like to hear how you think about the implications of Ukraine for Europe's involvement in the Indo-Pacific. Thank you, uh, Bonnie, and uh, thanks uh, also, Heather, for having placed this discussion now indeed into the um, context uh, we are currently in. There's war in Europe. There's war at our border. There's war at the borders of four of our member states. And we have hundreds of thousands of people coming into our member states to uh, flee from this, uh, you said, unprovoked military aggression. Yes, it is an invasion which is taking place. A conventional war in Europe of the dimensions we have not seen since the Second World War. And uh, this is an unprecedented situation. That means we are first and foremost focusing on coping with that uh, situation and there is an unprecedented degree of 
solidarity with the Ukraine, having worked for nine years on that part of the world and having been in charge of this when 2013, 2014 happened, I see that uh, lessons have been learned. Lessons have been learned from the last major crisis on Ukraine and lessons have been learned from the 1930s. So there is no illusion, unfortunately. We have to say any more about uh, the way this is being handled by our other big neighbor to the east, which is the Russian Federation, which is also a neighbor of several of our member states, now aggressing this country. And I would like to underline, it is not a regional conflict in the heart of Europe. It is a conflict of global dimensions, because this is a nuclear power. It is a permanent member state of the United Nations Security Council, which violates blatantly uh, the several of the core principles of the United Nations Charter, in particular, the sovereignty, independence, territorial integrity of a member state of the, the United Nations. And therefore, what happens now can happen at any time somewhere else if the right is determined by the might, if the one who has more uh, weapons available can determine what is right for the neighbor in terms of the national choices of the neighbor. That is the first global lesson. But the second lesson is also the uh, question of democracy, of freedom, of rule of law. And the Ukrainians have taken very clear decisions in which direction they want to go. Uh, they do not intend to uh, become part of the Russian Federation to uh, have a similar system as in the Russian Federation, they are they have made up their minds and they are trying to reform the country in such a way that there is a stable democracy and a functioning market economy. Uh, this invasion, therefore, has global implications, including for the Indo-Pacific region. And I'm glad to say that transatlantic coordination is unprecedented, as well as the total unity between all members of the European Union, between all members of NATO, between the G7 participating states uh, in defending these values of democracy, freedom, and the way we go about peace. So the fact that we have now adopted the harshest sanctions ever, and I would like to underline the SWIFT has been much discussed, and it is a very important step, uh, excluding a number of key Russian banks from this international payment system, which happens to be located here in Belgium, but also uh, the uh, blocking of the uh, this central bank reserve of Russia. 60% of these reserves uh, are in the uh, G7 country, and that amounts to 400 billion. These have now been blocked because of this illegal invasion of a neighboring country. Uh, there is therefore a determined response, not to speak about many concrete uh, support measures of uh, individual EU member states uh, for the Ukrainian armed forces. Uh, and also yesterday, first time ever, the EU decided to uh, provide uh, not less than 500 million euro for immediate uh, support for the Ukrainian armed forces, including lethal assistance. So bilateral and EU military and non-military assistance is being provided, uh, as well as a huge macro-financial aid package. In the short term, let me finish with this. We expect our partners from the uh, Indo-Pacific region to support us at the vote in the General Assembly. Uh, you have seen what happened in the Security Council, where Russia was isolated with its veto uh, and we had 82 co-sponsors. Uh, I hope that there will be many more, uh, including in particular from this region, uh, to support the, uh, the resolution currently being worked on by our colleagues in New York, uh, so that we have a very clear, unmistakably clear, uh, common message uh, to Russia that we cannot tolerate 
that this way to go about the rights of sovereign states. Thank you. Some of our viewers have already been sending questions in and I want to encourage people, if you have questions, just click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and I will try to get to them and maybe wrap uh, a few of them together. Uh, Kurt, let me ask you about uh, how the United States can weave together our allies and partners in Europe and in, uh, in the Indo-Pacific more effectively. Uh, this is clearly something uh, that uh, the U.S. wants to do in, in, in both places. Um, the, the EU uh, has, uh, is, is not a, a member of all of the institutions, but of course there are opportunities, uh, as I think is mentioned in the strategy, to interact in through activities with the Quad and maybe with AUKUS. So can you talk a little bit about the synergy and how we, we knit together our alliances and partners? Uh, thank you, Bonnie, it's a good question. Let me just say from the very uh, uh, outset of the Biden administration, um, one of the most important elements of our Indo-Pacific strategy is not just to double down on our partnerships across the Indo-Pacific region, a diverse region in which we're seeking uh, much uh, more intense interactions in technology, in diplomacy, in investment across the board, but also in Europe as well. And so you saw really unprecedented levels of strategic dialogues, of interactions with Gunnar and his team in virtually every European capital from the outset. And then, um, manifestations of cooperation in institutions like the TTC that had its first uh, meeting in Pittsburgh uh, in late 2021, uh, a number of uh, strategic discussions around uh, military issues, uh, coordination with Great Britain and others on, on, uh, on the naval activities in the Western Pacific. And then as you indicate some institutional connections uh, like AUKUS and the like going forward. I think what we have also seen now, uh, much of that really has been about Bonnie Europe more focused on the Indo-Pacific, right? That had been much of the directional indicators. What I think Ukraine is going to do is to energize the other part of that partnership, right? And so what we are seeing now is an unprecedented level of Asian interest and focus on an out of area question. Now, I think we, we know historically, Asian friends and partners have been more focused naturally on their own neighborhood. The sense of identity, the sense of responsibility, the sense of wanting to lend a hand and to join forces on all the issues that Gunnar described, not just practical issues, but ideological issues to sustain uh, a, a, you know, a, 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 a country under siege like Ukraine to support a common purpose. This is very significant. And I believe one of the, one of the outcomes of, of this uh, uh, tragedy uh, will be uh, the kind of new thinking around how to solidify institutional connections beyond what we've already seen between Europe and the Pacific. And I, I, I think we think, Bonnie, we've tried some of that in the past with mixed results. I believe one of the things that Gunnar is gonna seek to do, I think you will have our commitment in this, is to deepen the connections that we're now seeing uh, grow, frankly, before our eyes, in which it's not just Europe, uh, tilting or uh, pivoting to Asia, but it is also the Indo-Pacific recognizing that their destiny is also linked uh, uh, to, uh, to Europe. Thank you, Kurt. Um, I'm going to come back to you to uh, ask you some questions about, about China, but I first want to turn to Gunnar and, and ask uh, the EU strategy states that the increasing tensions in regional hotspots in the Indo-Pacific, and mentions South China Sea, East China Sea, and the Taiwan Strait, that these may have a direct impact on European security and prosperity. So can you elaborate on how European interests could be affected by tensions in these areas 
and whether you think that the risks are higher today because of uh, the, um, the war in Ukraine. Well, um, I think that this interconnectedness, which we know so much about in terms of our uh, fragile global supply, supply chain, which we know so much about in terms of our digital uh, connectivity, in terms of our uh, dependency on certain key inputs for our industry, uh, which are all uh, a result of the economic globalization, uh, are now in the um, minds of people becoming also more interconnected when you look at the security and strategic side. Uh, if you look at uh, cybersecurity, how much the connectedness we have can be interrupted. Uh, and we see right now what is happening in an uh, acute uh, conflict situation, but it happens also without any conflict happens as a means of influencing. Um, uh, when you look at um, narrative security, uh, yes, uh, our uh, European Union member states, the public has become more aware of the dangers which exist and which need to be uh, prevented uh, from becoming actual uh, real uh, threats to our prosperity and security. And uh, let me give the example that the uh, European uh, Member States just decided last week uh, to establish a new uh, area of enhanced maritime interest with the possibility to coordinate the presence of our national naval units in the northwest of the Indian Ocean, that means next to the uh, Gulf, next to, uh, uh, to um, uh, the Horn of Africa and going up to the, the Suez Canal. These um, steps illustrate uh, that we have become aware of uh, the many uh, security-related challenges and the need to work together with partners in addressing these um, and in defending the rules-based international order and defending international law, such as UNCLOS at the maritime field, uh, and to do this in the respect of, of sovereignty and national borders and territorial integrity. Uh, therefore, um, the, I think the realization of Indo-Pacific partners that uh, their interests um, and the principles uh, they stand for also need to be defended together with European partners. Kurt is referring to, well, the same realization has happened over the last year or so. Um, in, in collectively in the European Union. And that is why we agreed on a strategy on the end of Pacific uh, last year. First, the, the ministers in April and then the European Commission. And we have had the launch of a, a cooperation a platform at political level and just last week. While the Ukrainian crisis was unfolding, we did make a, our ministerial first ever European Union forum for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific with the strong participation from 60 countries and uh, regional organizations in Paris uh, and with a whole series of concrete action points, including of uh, security relevance, but frankly also in many other fields on connectivity, uh, on uh, uh, green transition, uh, on ocean governance, on uh, research and innovation and it is therefore, I have to insist, it's not just about security. Uh, it is also about dealing with many other global and, and, and regional uh, challenges. And I'm glad that we had already in December the opportunity to have a, a high level uh, consultation uh, with the United States between Deputy Secretary of State Sherman and our Secretary General Sanino uh, to uh, look at uh, these fields and to which degree there was a convergence uh, in, uh, shaping up between the European and the American thinking. And I'm glad to see that also at the US uh, Indo-Pacific strategy that uh, offer for cooperation is the main theme in a number of key policy areas. Thank you, Gunnar. 
Uh, Kurt, we have lots of questions coming in about China, and I will just try to put a few of them together. Uh, people are interested in understanding how you see China's role in, uh, in, in the Ukraine crisis, whether China has been an enabler, what its actions um, tell you about what it might do in the Indo-Pacific going forward. Uh, we have a question who would like to know if you see China as emboldened by this. And that, of course, has uh, potential implications for Taiwan. And it has been, uh, of course, reported this morning that President Biden is sending a group of senior former officials um, and military leaders to Taiwan today. So maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, uh, these issues and what the implications are for Indo-Pacific security. Um, thank you, Bonnie. Look, as you described, I think it is undeniable that right now uh, China is occupying uh, an awkward nexus uh, uh, in which they're trying to sustain their, their deep and fundamental relationship with Russia that was clearly put on display uh, in the immediate period in advance uh, of the Olympics with the historic statement, unprecedented statement between the two leaders. I think they have been um, uh, concerned uh, by some of the, um, both the solidarity that they, that uh, everyone has witnessed in the aftermath of the, uh, the invasion, but also by the brutality that is uh, playing out every day uh, with respect to an invasion. Um, I think it's too early to tell what, frankly, Bonnie, what conclusions anyone will draw from uh, a military conflict, an invasion that's only a couple of days old. Um, but I think it is our determination uh, to uh, keep lines of communication with China open. I think you know that we, uh, we engage China in advance uh, we explained to them what we thought were the risks associated with a reckless invasion and that uh, President Putin uh, was increasingly isolate, isolated, a, a lone leader uh, making decisions without very much effective feedback that China could play a critical role in uh, encouraging them to uh, reconsider some of their options. I think we believe they chose not to weigh in uh, in advance in this way. Um, I, I, I don't think we know how this will fundamentally play out uh, in uh, decision-making quarters in Beijing. Um, uh, I do think uh, that uh, the circumstances are difficult for them in the current uh, environment. And uh, it's clear from uh, our perspective that um, that the association uh, uh, so public and so deep between Russia and China uh, is indeed quite uncomfortable right now. Absolutely, completely agree. Let, let me talk um, or ask you to talk a little bit, uh, both of you, about the role of India as we have uh, several questions about how to promote a more active uh, Indian role, involvement in the region, um, both, of course, really in the Indo-Pacific, but also in the, in the, in the current crisis. Um, obviously, India has a very uh, long-standing relationship with Russia that has focused in large part on uh, military procurements, uh, but uh, Modi has uh, some relationship with, uh, with Putin. And uh, India has uh, a ways to go to become, I think, more actively involved in this crisis. So is that an area where the EU and the United States can work together to promote um, a more active role uh, by India, not just, of course, uh, in, in, uh, in Europe in this crisis, but also in the Indo-Pacific? So Gunnar, maybe I'll ask you first. I will answer you on India in a second, but I would like to uh, first uh, agree with Kurt. It is very important in this uh, extremely uh, tense and uh, very dangerous uh, situation uh, that we do uh, both keep very good 
uh, communication channels with China open. And uh, the uh, carefully negotiated, very long and unprecedented statement of the 4th of February between uh, China and Russia uh, it did um, bring uh, Russia to comment on uh, the situation in the South China Sea and did bring uh, China in, in commenting on European security, uh, which is the first time ever uh, they pronounced themselves on this. And perhaps some in Moscow could have interpreted from this that China was now structurally on the side of Russia and could always be counted upon. Uh, but we do see uh, with the abstention of China at the United Nations Security Council, which was a very uh, significant um, uh, move, uh, and we will see now how China positions itself in the General Assembly, uh, that China uh, does uphold uh, a number of key uh, principles in the uh, UN Charter in a way which is quite different from the way Russia interprets these. And uh, that it has to carefully weigh its international interest in a functioning system and with uh, peace, which allows um, stability and therefore also prosperity and uh, markets uh, with its um, pragmatic involvement with Russia, which um, of course is uh, also directed towards certain energy interests. Uh, we uh, need, therefore, to keep this good uh, conversation, and we do this um, with China uh, alive. Uh, apart from this, uh, both China and India have, of course, a very important influence on the um, voting pattern, on the behavior, on the positioning of so many other parties uh, from um, Asia, uh, but also from Africa and partially from Latin America. And there is a huge responsibility there for, for both uh, whether they contribute uh, to uphold uh, proactively uh, in such a situation um, the key principles of the United Nations um, or not. And uh, the uh, Indian uh, side uh, is, uh, of course, much more engaged on the Indo-Pacific issues for a number of years now, and in particular with the US, and in particular through the court, um, but also uh, works uh, well with the European Union on this. Uh, they were actively participating in the Indo Pacific Syrian meeting last uh, week uh, with very good contributions of Mr. Derek Banker. We, had, we have also um, uh, EU India uh, connectivity partnership, which partially is uh, with regard to better connect India with Europe, but more is also about working with India in other parts of the world together. Uh, and um, I uh, do believe that um, whether it is on connectivity, whether it's on climate change, green transition, uh, or whether it is indeed also on uh, security and in particular maritime security, India is a key part a very important partner, and therefore we have a uh, high expectation that India would also, when it comes to difficult choices in the multilateral uh, context, um, be uh, a very responsible actor. Kurt, you want to add to that? Yeah, thanks, Bonnie. Um, first of all, Gunnar is an excellent diplomat, and I fully agree that we've got to keep those lines of communication open between not only Europe and China, but the United States and China on these matters. But I also think we have to acknowledge that there are elements of the Russia-China relationship that are even playing out as we speak that are worrisome and regrettable, and they have to be watched carefully. I just want to underscore that that's a balance that we're going to have to be honest about and direct about as we go forward. So on, on India, I think, Bonnie, as you know, um, we've seen unprecedented progress with respect to the engagement of India, not just bilaterally with the United States, but with other countries in Europe, in the Quad more directly. They've been a key member of the Quad, supportive, enthusiastic. So we're, um, uh, we're quite hopeful, uh, we're bullish about the relationship uh, with India going forward. 
uh, we have a, uh, a deep dialogue with them uh, on issues uh, underway now. I think our ultimate goal will to see was to see India's uh, trajectory bending more towards working with the United States and partners. We understand, as our spokesman and others have uh, uh, underscored, uh, India's uh, historic long-standing relationship uh, uh, with uh, Russia, but at the same time, uh, ultimately, uh, we believe uh, that uh, India will be moving uh, in our direction over time. There's been a couple of questions, Kurt, about uh, the economic pillar of uh, the Indo-Pacific strategy, which, which, which I know is something that is very much on your mind. I want to give you an opportunity perhaps to tell people um, about what, uh, if you can, maybe how you are fleshing out the Indo-Pacific economic framework. Uh, there's obviously a huge appetite uh, for U.S economic engagement uh, in the region. And I think uh, hopes that this will be a very substantial um, uh, policy in, in the region. But uh, I know uh, there's been a discussion about it being rolled out uh, soon. One uh, person sent in a question that uh, is, can the economic solidarity displayed by the West during this crisis translate into more economic initiatives by the U.S. focused on the Indo-Pacific? And the questioner mentions uh, joining uh, the CPTPP as well as other trade actions. So if you can address that set of issues. Thanks, Bonnie. And I appreciate the questions here. Let me just underscore that there is a deep recognition and intention uh, here inside the government uh, in the White House to sustain every element of our uh, engagement in the Indo-Pacific going forward. We all recognize the intensity and the importance of standing shoulder to shoulder with Europe and working closely uh, with Ukrainian partners. At many points of, in our history, we've had to sustain deep engagements in two theaters simultaneously. Uh, we did it during the Second World War. We did it during the Cold War. It's difficult, it's expensive, but it is also essential. And I believe that we're entering a period where that is what will be demanded of the United States and this generation of Americans. We can talk more about that as we go forward, but. Bonnie, I do want to underscore more directly that you will see over the course of the next several months a determination to sustain high-level engagement in the Indo-Pacific with presidential travel. Uh, we will be announcing that the ASEAN leaders for the first time will be coming to Washington in March. Uh, shortly, uh, you described the unofficial delegation that we've uh, asked to go to Taiwan to underscore a consistent message of enduring support to maintain peace and stability. You will see a whole range of activities across the board, diplomatically, institutionally of the kind that you described, and yes, investment and also uh, economic and trade. Um, I, I think it would be fair to say, Bonnie, that uh, the question comes at a time where I do believe that there will be some both transference and lessons learned, and if anything, a catalyst to move more purposefully in the realm of economic engagement. We're right in the midst of substantial discussions with potential partners in the Indo-Pacific with uh, Secretary Raimondo at Commerce, Ambassador Tai at uh, USTR. This is an unprecedented coupling of two agencies bringing their substantial capacities together, working with partners across the Indo-Pacific um, about a ambitious agenda, uh, which basically combines a number of avenues of potential cooperation, not simply the digital uh, aspect that has received most of the attention, but work together on issues associated with climate, labor study, uh, labor uh, 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 criteria, also issues associated with supply chains. It's quite ambitious. Um, Lots of discussions. It, it, in many respects, it is first of a kind, but it also um, bespeaks our intention not only to recreate elements of a trade and commercial relationship that serve the interests of not just uh, large corporate players, but people, 
who are deeply affected by uh, economic interplay, but also show an America that is committed economically and commercially to the vitality of the region as a whole. This is laid out clearly in the Indo-Pacific strategy uh, as a first step, and we intend over the course of the next several months to intensify and double down on a deep set of interactions with a key group of partners, not just the advanced economies, but economies that are emerging on the global stage that want closer connectivity and partnership with the United States. We intend to provide that. Gunnar, um, the, uh, the question um, arises about sort of what, what are the ways specifically that Europe and the United States can work together on the ground uh, in, in the Indo-Pacific? So not just work really on the Indo-Pacific together, but to work in the Indo-Pacific together. So can you talk a little bit about that and the strengths that you think Europe and the EU bring to the region? What are the ways in which, uh, in which the EU can make the strongest contributions? Yes, uh, of course, since we have now seen the uh, unveiling of the uh, Indo-Pacific strategy of the United States, uh, which is uh, a document which is much more specific in a number of core policy areas than what we have seen under the previous administration. Uh, we are uh, trying to uh, connect the dots between our uh, rollout, our strategy, and I pointed you to the many concrete actions we have already agreed with Indo-Pacific partners last week and what we could do together in cooperating with the United States, uh, which is uh, one of the uh, like-minded partners who have an Indo-Pacific policy on their own. And of course, with those who have an Indo-Pacific strategy on their own, we will be by definition better be able to uh, uh, cooperate. But um, let me underline that, and I think this is also the spirit of the US that uh, we have made an offer for cooperation uh, across the region. So there will be different uh, types of cooperation and different levels of strength of cooperation with different partners, depending on their uh, readiness and interest. But as regards the US, I would say that we have a high degree of um, convergence. And I know that the next uh, part of the event you talk about to which degree the EU will align with the US. That's not a term we use here at Brussels. Uh, we don't align, but we may uh, identify areas of convergence. And uh, I think they, these are definitely uh, there. And um, I think the key areas are, are probably uh, four. Um, there may be more, but uh, first and foremost, it's, it's connectivity. Um, and the uh, initiative of uh, President Biden back better. Our global gateway gives us uh, many opportunities. And the challenge is the same for both of us. It is about how do we most effectively mobilize the private sector and how most effectively we mobilize our uh, banking system, both uh, private and public uh, banking, uh, to uh, get the investments done. But it must be uh, investments which are which, which do constitute uh, an interest, uh, which is also one of the private sector and not just uh, one for uh, public visibility purposes. Uh, and uh, we are now identifying flagships. I told you about the connectivity partnerships with Japan and India. We enter hopefully also into something similar, very concrete with the projects with ASEAN. And uh, the US will soon have its ASEAN summit, we also will have uh, our first summit as leaders uh, for the end of the year in Russia. So connectivity one, climate change second. Um, this is uh, the big challenge of our times. We are very pleased to see that this administration recognizes fully that climate change is probably the most fundamental challenge for all of our uh, society and that uh, we must get it right, and there must be major efforts now. 
And uh, for this purpose, we will enter into several uh, green uh, alliances and partnerships with different countries from the most advanced, like uh, Japan or Korea, in terms of these changes, uh, to those who really uh, struggle with it, uh, such as Indonesia. Uh, and uh, we want to work together with partners, and I think there's a good area where we should work with the U.S. Third is maritime cooperation, and that is uh, both maritime uh, security cooperation, but it is also uh, about fisheries, about ocean governance. Uh, and lastly is the, the digital area uh, to which Kurt already referred, and uh, where we intend to enter digital partnership with several uh, partners now because it is an area is not really codified internationally. It is not codified bilaterally, but it has become a key reality of our economies. Let me finish, uh, if you allow, by commenting briefly on the uh, economic question which you put to the U.S., but which you didn't put to us. Uh, that means probably that it is less defined in the U.S. context than in the European Union context, but I would like for the benefit of our uh, participants to uh, say that uh, we want to step up indeed our uh, engagement on the uh, uh, diversifying of trade and economic relations and yes with a liberalization uh, agenda uh, you, you know that uh, we had agreed on uh, FTAs with Vietnam and Singapore they are in force we are in the midst of negotiations with Australia New Zealand Indonesia uh, which we intend to complete perhaps some of them this year perhaps others next year uh, we uh, will resume trade negotiations and investment protection uh, with india uh, later this year uh, we will complete an economic partnership agreement with east africa with the east africa community and we will assess the possible resumption of uh, trade negotiations with malaysia the philippines and thailand once the conditions are right and even the eventual negotiation of the region-to-region -region trade agreement with us. So we do not join RCEP, we do not ask for CPTPP, but uh, we do believe that uh, a deep and comprehensive uh, trade negotiations uh, lead to good results uh, with a specific partner, and uh, we will uh, continue on that. Kurt, uh, I have a question for you that has come in um, about whether the Ukraine invasion changes the U.S. calculus on uh, the issue of whether the U.S. should shift from strategic ambiguity to strategic clarity uh, regarding Taiwan. Um, and uh, is it helpful to have former Prime Minister Abe uh, making this case? I know this is something you've talked about before, uh, and uh, I tend to agree with what you have said, but I want to give you an opportunity to say whether uh, your analysis of the situation and your thinking about U.S. policy has in any way changed um, as a result of uh, the situation in, in Ukraine. And uh, I know uh, there is reason to be concerned about uh, China's intentions toward Taiwan later this year. Uh, in fact, we know that Xi Jinping is likely to launch a new uh, uh, strategic plan toward uh, Taiwan that has been talked about uh, within China. And this is undoubtedly worrisome uh, since uh, Xi Jinping is about to enter his third five-year term. So has your, has your thinking uh, changed on, on these issues at all? Thanks, Bonnie. I would just simply uh, reply that our policy uh, remains consistent, uh, robust, uh, bipartisan, and longstanding. Okay. Um, let me then ask you a question about uh, Southeast Asia, which we have not yet discussed. And uh, the, the Biden administration has, I think, done some a, a really terrific job uh, over the last uh, six months or so in strengthening our ties with Southeast Asia. There's been some really excellent visits um, and uh, the president is uh, supposed to be hosting the, uh, the ASEAN leaders uh, soon uh, this year. And I know that they are very much looking forward to that as I've talked with diplomats from their, uh, from their embassies. Southeast Asia is pivotal 
um, in the Indo-Pacific region. And uh, yet uh, uh, the, the latest um, ICES poll, which I always read very closely because it provides such interesting insights into how the region uh, is looking at China and the United States and its own problems. And that latest poll shows that confidence in the United States as a strategic partner and security provider declined from 55% to 43% over uh, the last year. So I wonder if um, you have some thoughts about what else uh, the U.S. should be doing in, in Southeast Asia, and then maybe I'll ask Gunnar uh, about the EU's approach uh, to Southeast Asia. Um, look, Bonnie, thank you very much. It's an excellent question and a good scene setter more generally. I think the most important thing um, to recognize is that, that U.S. policy has to be manifested over a substantial period of time across many dimensions. And so judgments about the United States, the depth of engagement, the seriousness of our focus, the um, reliability can only be determined uh, in, uh, frankly, totality over a longer period of time. We also believe that steps like you described, which is unprecedented focus between the president and ASEAN leaders as we host them for a substantial period in Washington, D.C., in which we'll be able to talk about a range of issues, not just security, but our shared uh, interest in dealing with COVID, in uh, climate issues, in uh, every element of uh, maritime domain awareness, just we can go down the list, all the areas that we, we share common interests. Uh, I also believe, as you described, that much of our engagement has been under the radar screen, even though important, and I think we want to highlight that and raise that up uh, more. I think we all recognize that both individual states in Southeast Asia and ASEAN as an institution will be critical for us going forward. And you will see efforts uh, later this year with the president traveling uh, to engage in the key institutional gatherings that are manifested by ASEAN, uh, a strong determination of the United States to hold its own and pull its weight uh, uh, in this critical region. I also believe that you will see that some of the new innovations like Build Back Better World, um, uh, the, uh, the uh, DFC, substantial investments and uh, support for initiatives across the region. You will also have noted that how important it will be to, to deliver um, uh, on some of the billion doses that uh, the Quad uh, will be producing over the course of this year, uh, the, the necessary share uh, to Southeast Asia. So we wanna try to tackle this issue from uh, uh, a multiple venues, not just the security issues, but the day-to-day -day needs that we see manifest, manifested every day with respect to COVID and climate and uh, food uh, uh, safety, everything that we think the United States can play a role in. And I do want to say more directly, we are finding that our ability to work in partnership with other countries in Northeast Asia, um, with Europe, that will be the defining feature of our major diplomatic initiatives. We will seek to work more uh, with partnership. And so if you look closely at the Indo-Pacific document, and I, you'll be, you know, uh, have the opportunity next to hear from its dominant uh, author, the person who did all the interactions and engagements inside the U.S. government and with partners in Europe and across Asia, Mirarap Hooper, but you will find that the dominant feature of this document, the one that set, you know, the, the, there's a history of these. I think the, the, the dominant feature here is a recognition that anything that is important and of purpose has to be done in partnership. Uh, uh, with not only Asian partners, but as Gunnar has, I think, very rightly noted with Indo-Pacific partners as well. And that is our intention. And that, I think, is the most important and enduring contribution of the Indo-Pacific uh, strategy. And that's one that we're proud of and 
we're going to uh, we're going to work on. I, you know, the United States is not always the easiest country to cooperate with. Gunnar can probably help us understand that. We are trying to learn habits of effective cooperation and recognize that you know putting uh, our best foot forward in conjunction with other countries is our best way uh, to accomplish some of our larger goals and ambitions, particularly in a key region like Southeast Asia. So sorry, I was muted. Gunnar, what would you like to add? Um, uh, Southeast Asia or any other closing remarks you'd like to make? Uh, first to uh, give the compliments back to Kurt, uh, who is a very skillful uh, diplomat and uh, who recognizes the uh, challenges for the United States to indeed um, structurally to reach out to improve cooperation with many partners around the globe, which was perhaps not always so easy, but is definitely a hallmark of this administration. Which appreciate we have unprecedented degrees of transatlantic uh, cooperation in the number of uh, fields, and the Trade Technology Council was mentioned in the earlier, or the Energy Council uh, on ASEAN. Just to say, that, um, we have uh, 45 years of relations uh, with this. Um, uh, second most advanced regional integration scheme. Uh, and we have um, last year, in fact, it was 2020, agreed to lift this now, our dialogue partnership, which we have for decades to lift this to the strategic partnership. And um, that um, will allow us to move uh, on a couple of issues uh, in the run up to that summit. And uh, it will be, uh, I think, interesting to observe that we intend to do, uh, and this is probably the first part now with whom we would do this, uh, to enter into a joint, um, uh, joint uh, political um, expression on the Indo-Pacific. You know that um, ASEAN has an Indo-Pacific outlook, uh, which allowed itself to engage with many other partners over the challenges in that region and to emphasize ASEAN centrality. We very much respect ASEAN centrality and wish to re reflect this there. The main um, challenge, uh, apart from overcoming the very negative impact of the COVID uh, for the recovery of many of the countries, and I think we should, um, we should uh, value this difference, which many of our highly prosperous societies uh, who can muster huge recovery programs uh, with their public finances, uh, which is not um, uh, necessarily possible for everybody, uh, even in such a dynamic region as ASEAN. So the recovery um, after COVID uh, and all the health related needs on how to better prevent and respond um, to pandemics will also be key, I think, as in the US uh, ASEAN interaction. We would like to emphasize in particular also the green transition, which we know um, not only China is eager to actually enter into and not only India, but increasingly also ASEAN partners. And it is a question of getting fit for the future. And we, we are currently putting together a, uh, um, a joint energy transition program with South Africa, how to get out of a coal-based um, energy situation and we hopefully will be able to do something similar with Indonesia, which could send, set a new standard. And uh, Indonesia also as G20 uh, chair this year may uh, be uh, a very good best practice therefore. And uh, I emphasize once again, connectivity. With regard to security, um, uh, ASEAN has started to have also region um, actions um, in, in, in different fields and there's the defense uh, coordination. Uh, we have uh, a lot of experience, again, as European Union in uh, acting in uh, difficult areas uh, outside of uh, the European uh, Union territory and wish to share this notably on maritime security and on peacekeeping. So there are quite a number of fields uh, and ASEAN, as Kurt said, is really uh, a central part of this wide region of the Indo-Pacific and should give the example of uh, cooperation. Unfortunately, we all have to reckon with the uh, 
the significant challenges which arise from the fact that the military has seized power in Myanmar and has also a, um, uh, a stifling impact on decision making in ASEAN. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Well, in dealing with the challenges that we face in the Indo-Pacific, as well as, uh, of course, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we cannot underestimate how important U.S. alliances are. Um, and knitting these alliances together, I think, in the Pacific and, uh, and, in, uh, and in Europe will be increasingly uh, necessary. Uh, so I want to thank both of you, our very skilled diplomats, uh, Kurt Campbell uh, and Gunnar Vegan. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Uh, we greatly appreciate uh, all of your the work that you are doing and taking time out of your busy schedules. We are now going to uh, take care. All the best. We're going to turn now to our second uh, panel. I'm going to turn the floor over to my colleague in the Asia program at the German Marshall Fund, uh, Garima Mohan, who is, uh, is a fellow uh, with us at GMF, and she is going to moderate our second panel. So if the uh, speakers uh, can turn on their cameras, uh, we will be joined uh, both by uh, Mira Rapp Hooper and uh, Gabrielle Vicente. So please turn on your cameras and uh, we will, I will turn the floor over to Garima. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, for the panel discussion we will transition into now, we'll really dig into the details of how the United States and Europe can implement their cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, for the panel today, I plan to cover four topics with my esteemed speakers. We'll first start with the um, invasion of Ukraine and what that really means for resources and political will the US and Europe can um, devote to the Indo-Pacific. We'll then talk about um, areas of overlap and perhaps differences in the US and European Indo-Pacific strategies. We'll delve into concrete projects uh, geographies and theaters these two partners can work in in the Indo-Pacific. And finally, I'd like to talk about structures. How can we make sure that Europe plugs into the right conversations in the Indo-Pacific in a way that is useful for partners and allies, uh, not just the United States, but also other partners in the Indo-Pacific? Um, as Bonnie mentioned, to answer these questions, we have we're really thrilled to have these two speakers with us who've played uh, critical roles in implementing and formulating their respective Indo-Pacific strategies. Very happy to welcome uh, Gabriel Vicentin, uh, the EU Special Envoy for the Indo-Pacific, and of course, Mira Rapp Hooper, uh, Director for Indo-Pacific Strategy at the National Security Council. Thank you very much, uh, both of you, for joining us. Of course, uh, you can also join the conversation, uh, the audience uh, listening to us. If you have questions for our speakers, please drop them into the Q&A box and I will get to them in a minute. So let's start with the question I think is on the forefront of all of our minds and has been covered um, in the broader sense in the first panel, the impact of the crisis in Ukraine on the resources um, as well as political will. Uh, will that impact how your respective Indo-Pacific strategies unfold? Uh, the last week has seen really tectonic shifts in, in Europe uh, with the seminal speech by uh, Chancellor Scholz in, the, uh, in Germany and also with the EU's decision to finance uh, purchase and delivery of weapons and equipment for Ukraine, really unprecedented. Um, if the EU becomes a stronger geopolitical player, it is, of course, um, would be significant in the neighborhood, but also beyond. But in the short term, how do you think this crisis will impact on your respective Indo-Pacific strategies? And let's start first with you, Gabriel, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Garima. Thanks to, to the German Marshall Fund for having me today. And I will thanks a lot to Mira for, for sharing the, the floor with me. It's going to be a pleasure. We already met in, uh, in, in Washington in December. So it's really a great pleasure to, to, to be with you today. Well, yeah, uh, 
it's obviously it's an it's an unprecedented uh, let's say uh, event that we are facing and it is also an unprecedented way that the eu uh, united uh, itself quickly swiftly and uh, and uh, with no hesitations um, i would like really to underline this because uh, there were three subsequent packages of sanctions uh, culminating also with the decision yesterday night to finance the uh, 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 purchase and delivery of uh, weapons to Ukraine as well. So this is really a, a, a watershed moment, I would say, in the history in the history of the EU. Uh, and uh, it is, in my view, a point of no return in uh, the uh, history of the European integration. Um, I've been working, if you allow me a little, uh, a little personal note, uh, I've been working in now in the foreign affairs of the EU since around 15 years, before in the Commission and now at the European External Action Service. And I have to tell you without hesitation that it is the first day in which I really feel that the common foreign security policy of the EU delivers. Uh, and uh, yeah, we have done many good things, but what is happening today is really making me feel, um, well, I don't want to overdo, but today I think I'm enabled to, I really feel proud. I really feel proud of what the EU has been able to do and what we have been able to do progressively, uh, which means that it was well thought of. Uh, it was not rushed. Uh, some people say it was late, but I don't think it was simply well thought of. Now, sorry for having taken this uh, 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 a lot of time to introduce it, to introduce the subject, but you might understand how uh, we, we feel part of a really of a big project which is unfolding nowadays here in, in, in Brussels. Uh, paradoxically, to come back to your question, I think that what is happening today in Ukraine will even encourage us and push us as to do even more in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, the links between what is happening in Ukraine and what might happen or what the implications could be for the Indo-Pacific are evident. The respect of the UN Charter, the respect for sovereignty, the respect for territorial integrity of states, I could list all of them. I mean, Gunnar and 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 uh, and his counterpart already mentioned them, so I will not repeat. But in my view, uh, in the big picture, what is happening in Ukraine uh, will reinforce uh, our aim and stance in doing more in the Indo-Pacific according to our strategies. Um, I will anticipate one of your questions, but I really like a lot uh, what unifies us the most. And both our strategies have a keyword, which is democracies. And I really think that we should build on this to show that democracies deliver. And, and this happens in the Eastern neighborhood of the EU, but this happens in the Indo-Pacific as well. So. I will answer you with a paradox, not at all. Uh, the, the resources that we are putting uh, in the Ukrainian crisis will not affect at all our, our uh, work in the, in the Indo-Pacific. Um, what has been uh, uh, announced yesterday also, it's a technicality, but it's important. It's not a commitment of the EU's budget. It's a decision of the member states to go and finance in a coordinated way the weapons. Uh, so it's the European Facility Fund, uh, which is not EU's budget, but it is single member states which get together and chip in. Uh, it's, it's a paramount important. It's not just legalistic, it's very political as well. But uh, there you go, it's the, it's the EU ministers which have decided to go ahead and we are very happy and we will surely also complement with anything necessary also in terms of EU's budget and action. For example, let me say something else. Uh, in terms of EU's competence, well, it was decided to uh, grant access to the soil of the EU's to the Ukrainian refugees without them having to file for asylum, which is unprecedented as well. And I'm really proud of this as well. So that's it. Uh, uh, apart from all this kind of 
pride, which comes from the latest, from the EU side, uh, I, I really, maybe we will discuss about the similarities with the EU's Indo-Pacific uh, at a later stage. So I think I can give you back the floor. I'm sorry for having been quite long. Not at all, uh, not at all. And thank you so much for clarifying the budgetary question, which is in fact essential when it comes to resource allocation and underlining importance of you know, geographies within the EU setup. Uh, Mira, similar question to you, of course, uh, analysts have been asking whether the US can stay engaged in both theaters, whether one uh, area will distract from the other. How would you respond to that? Karima, thank you so much um, for the question. Thank you so much for having us. Gabriele, it's really a treat to get to share the screen with you, uh, especially on a day like today. And I do find myself even more optimistic and resolved after your opening comments. Um, I also want to share a special thanks to Bonnie Glazer, uh, a, a longtime colleague and friend uh, for her leadership uh, at GMF um, and on this event in particular. And finally, of course, to express my solidarity uh, with friends in Ukraine and all over Europe um, at this moment of completely unprovoked, wanton, unjustified aggression, uh, but also a moment of extraordinary solidarity, um, where I do believe we are seeing historic transformations take place um, in a course of hours, history accelerating over a course of days, um, both in the uh, EU, in Europe, um, and in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and I think that the work that GMF does to sustain transatlantic unity um, is particularly important at a time like this. And I know we're all really grateful um, to have this set of colleagues for a conversation like this one. Uh, I'll build on what Gabriele just said, which is to say that I feel quite confident um, that this war against Ukraine will not divert the United States from its approach to the Indo-Pacific or specifically the Indo-Pacific strategy that we put down on paper. Um, and the reason for that is clear. Uh, the president and our top foreign policy leadership uh, have made clear in no uncertain terms that the Indo-Pacific is a priority theater for U.S. foreign policy, not this year, not next year, but for the long term, um, and that our presence there must be long term. And that calculation, those words written in this strategy, were not impervious to crisis. They accounted for the fact that crises would continue to happen, um, including in other areas of in extreme importance to the United States, um, and that nevertheless, we would stay the course. And indeed, if you think about the timing that the Indo-Pacific strategy uh, was issued on, that point is reinforced. We released this document uh, on February 11th, Friday, February 11th, uh, within minutes of our national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, just having left the podium where he warned Americans to leave Ukraine. And he made the clearest that we had to date in no uncertain terms that the United States believed there was an extremely high chance that what Russia would attack in the coming days. Uh, so it was not in spite of the situation uh, in Europe, but rather with deep acknowledgement of what was unfolding that we released this strategy. And part of the reason we did so along that timeline was to signal both to the region and to the world that no matter what happened in Europe, we had a plan for Asia that was already unfolding. We had a set of steps that we intended to take in the next 12 to 24 months, uh, no matter what horror was inflicted on the people of Ukraine, and that there was a list of priorities that the public and that our allies around the world could hold us to, um, even as we manage this crisis. So that public statement in the Indo-Pacific strategy was quite purposely not just an Indo-Pacific strategy, but an Indo-Pacific strategy that it is very much intended to endure alongside um, what we are now all managing uh, in Europe today. I'll also reinforce the fact that uh, this strategy was released with the Secretary of State in Asia um, for his fourth time um, in just over a year. He uh, took a trip to Asia that included stops to meet with the Quad in Australia, with Pacific Island leaders in Fiji, um, and with our close allies, the ROK and Japan in Hawaii, despite the fact um, that he was well aware of the fact that we were on the brink of war. And that trip too was intended to reinforce the fact that the United States would not and could not take its eye off the Indo-Pacific. Um, now, the question that you've asked about resources is a critical one, and uh, I'm not going to suggest for a moment that it's not difficult 
shifts to balance resources when you're trying to do a lot of things in two critical theaters in the world. As Kurt said before, of course, the United States has maintained a focus on Europe and Asia before, um, but it has done so with intensity in true crisis moments. Um, I nonetheless think that you're going to see that motivation rise to the occasion um, and to keep up our focus in both areas uh, because we do see the urgency in both theaters. But I'll also note, as Gabriele did, that there are some um, sort of exigencies when it comes to budget and resources uh, that should make us somewhat optimistic. The aid that we are issuing to Ukraine right now, that we are delivering right now, is being programmed right now. Uh, when we uh, set about to resource the Indo-Pacific strategy, we acknowledge and plan for a resourcing effort that is going to be a multi-year long-term plan. Um, and that is frankly going to proceed somewhat incrementally. Um, you'll see some changes in our budget reflected in the president's budget that will be released soon that will reflect this strategy, but we'll have a lot more work to do to continue to move the ball forward on that resourcing for the next year and the year after. And we're already programming uh, through our annual budgets for the fiscal year 23 and 24. Um, so there is a way in the resources in which the resources that we are sending to Ukraine that right now are actually quite distinct um, for what we're trying to do on the Indo-Pacific strategy. Again, that does not mean that we won't feel moments of resource scarcity, but it does mean that we can plan for both simultaneously. Great. Um, thank you very much. That's extremely useful um, to hear from the outside. Um, let's let's take a step back and delve into the two strategies. Um, Gabrielle, you you anticipated this question, what commonality, <laughs> you know, when you read the US Indo-Pacific strategy, what was your takeaway? What areas of overlap did you see? And perhaps um, subtle differences as well. Uh, would be curious to see how the how Brussels received it. But already the fact of receiving it was extremely <laughs> welcome. It was really waited uh, for, for, for long and we were really delighted to see it. Uh, already in, in, uh, when we visited Washington for the first ever uh, US-EU uh, uh, um, consultations on Indo-Pacific, we were more or less, uh, let's say, made aware of what the uh, US strategy, strategy would have been about and when when it was uh, finally released, uh, it did not come as a surprise, I mean, its content. Mm. So uh, basically, it was extremely uh, welcome the fact that uh, uh, Secretary Blinken, when uh, uh, talking about it in his speech in Jakarta, referred to the uh, EU's and its, its, uh, and its strategy. So already that was an extremely uh, welcome uh, uh, signal. But the strategy itself uh, mentioned uh, the EU and uh, its strategy uh, several times. Um, and it's, uh, it, I would really see, uh, maybe I'm a bit too optimistic, but I would see uh, a, almost a total convergence in views uh, and in aims. So we both talk about um, a free and open Indo-Pacific, uh, access to open, uh, open uh, Indo-Pacific. We talk about the uh, promotion of, of multilateral cooperation, centrality of ASEAN. Um, we uh, insist, both of our strategy do insist on what I would call an economic and developmental might, uh, not just a, a military might. And I think this is, uh, a very uh, important aspect that we should both uh, underline. Um, the, the American strategy looks also to me, if I am allowed uh, to comment between the previous administration strategy and this administration strategy, going a little bit towards uh, what I would call in diplomatic term, inclusiveness of the local partners. Uh, aiming more at, com at confrontation, uh, at cooperation rather than at confrontation. And this is very much like the uh, uh, EU's uh, uh, strategy spirit. So uh, basically, I would say that the overall philosophy, structure, and main aims are, are really uh, uh, coinciding. But I don't know if, uh, if I am too optimistic. 
but I promise I don't have put uh, pink glasses on my pink lenses on my on my on my glasses. All right, let's let's get a view from the other side. Um, and Mira, as you were writing the the strategy, uh, did you see areas of overlap, not just with the EU, but also member states and uh, any differences that you may think could could be perhaps stumbling blocks when we when we dig into the question of of concrete um, cooperation in the Indo Pacific. Uh, thank you. Um, I absolutely agree with Gabriele. You know, I think the the consonance is overwhelming. Um, it is they are almost completely aligned strategies. Um, and as the strategy that came second, I can say that that is not accidental. Um, you know, as we began our own process of developing an American strategy for the Indo-Pacific in this administration, um, we were keenly aware of the EU's process. Uh, we not only had the opportunity to brief closely um, EU colleagues during Indo-Pacific consultations. Um, in December, we've been in touch through a variety of mechanisms over the course of the last several months. Um, and while the United States had a very clear vision of what it wanted to put down on paper to achieve in the Indo-Pacific, I think the thing that should stand out to you above all else in our new Indo-Pacific strategy is that we are making clear that allies and partners are not a luxury, they are a strategic necessity, and that our strategy simply cannot be accomplished alone. And as a result, thinking about consonants and alignment with, overlap with our closest allies and partners, not just in the Indo-Pacific, but in Europe and in the EU was an essential factor. Um, because if we called for allied unity, but those strategies were not aligned, if they didn't uh, share the same overarching objectives as well as the same sort of regional and functional priorities, then we would have a much harder time actually implementing uh, what we were calling for. Um, so, you know, I think it's it's worth just acknowledging that this is all uh, baked into the process of the American strategy. And indeed, you'll see one rather lengthy paragraph in which we sort of acknowledge what we have drawn from other allies' strategies, including um, the EU and some EU member states to just be transparent about the fact that this is how um, we have gone about our process. Uh, when it comes to where the areas of clearest alignment are, I would point um, to a few that I think uh, really uh, emerge as priorities for US and EU cooperation, um, not only in our documents, but over the course of the initial conversations that we've started to have together. Uh, the first is on maritime security, where I think there is just a fundamental, um, you know, vital interest uh, from both the U.S. and the EU in seeing uh, maritime security based in international law and working with like-minded allies and partners around the region to ensure um, that this is carried forward. Uh, here, I also want to commend and sort of further to uh, the prior conversation about the fact that neither one of us is going to take our eyes off the Indo-Pacific, um, the recent uh, EU foreign ministerial meeting that took place in Paris, uh, in which our EU colleagues established a maritime area of interest in the Indian Ocean, um, which is an incredibly important advancement. Um, and even as we're talking about sort of transformational security changes that are taking place in the EU as a result of the war against Ukraine, we should also acknowledge really important steps that were being uh, furthered, even even before the war um, inside the EU with respect to the Indo-Pacific, such as the zone of interest in the Indian Ocean. Uh, so again, I think maritime security is sort of leading the charge amongst um, key areas of convergence. Uh, the second that I would point to, obviously, um, is infrastructure and connectivity, where, of course, we've seen the EU's Global Gateway Initiative, the United States B3W Initiative, um, and a lot of stated interest in similar kinds of infrastructure provision amongst like-minded partners, um, with a big emphasis, again, as uh, Gunnar and Kurt discussed, on digital connectivity. Um, and I think we're, we're very much aligned um, in the pressing need uh, to contribute to the region high standards uh, infrastructure with an emphasis on digital connectivity. Um, now, of course, that's sort of easier said than done. Doing infrastructure cooperation is hard. Uh, doing it as an EU 27 is harder. Doing it as a 27 plus the United States will be harder still, but I think there um, is a lot of work we can do there together and we should um, dig into that in more detail. I also think that climate change and climate resilience is an area of huge convergence um, because we do see uh, both of us, the Indo-Pacific as in many ways the epicenter of the climate crisis, but also a 
region in which there's extraordinary climate opportunity if we act quickly. Um, finally, as far as sort of subregions are concerned, I think we both place a great amount of emphasis on deepening, co deepening cooperation with ASEAN um, and ensuring ASEAN centrality, uh, independence, and strength. Uh, and we also have expressed a lot of interest in working more closely with the Pacific Islands, particularly in some of the functional areas that I just laid out. If I was going to point to any differences, um, there is some difference in the language that we use to address China. Obviously, um, the U.S. language is a little bit more unvarnished um, in the way that we assess China. Obviously, it does describe the way that we see our bilateral competition with China, in addition to how we understand China's role to be affecting the region. Uh, but I think probably that does not come as a surprise. Um, and then, of course, the tools that we're offering up in both the trade and economic spaces are a little bit different, but ultimately, I think, complementary. I'll stop there for now because I know we'll dig into those areas over the course of the conversation. Great. Um, while I have you, Mira, there is a question from the audience about the Indian Ocean. Uh, the EU strategy focuses very much on the Indian Ocean. It calls it a gateway to the Indo-Pacific, whereas uh, the, the question asker mentions that the US strategy seems to focus more on the Pacific when it comes to actors and trends that are mentioned. Um, how how would you you know comment on that a difference? And I'll also come to to Gabriel to get his his opinion. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think it's an astute observation. Certainly, um, the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy does include the Indian Ocean, and all of its principles and objectives extend to the Indian Ocean. Um, but what the questioner has zeroed in on is the fact um, that the U.S. and the EU definitions of the Indo-Pacific are actually a little bit different. Um, the United States definition of the Indian Ocean uh, extends from the west coast of the United States, um, to include the Indian subcontinent, but does not include the coast of Africa. Um, so it includes part of, but not the entire Indian Ocean. Um, whereas uh, for the EU, in my understanding, and for um, some member states, uh, the Indian subcontinent and the entire Indian Ocean are included in the definition of the Indo Pacific. Um, and of course, Europe's location, obviously closer to the Indian Ocean, um, changes a little bit the emphasis that we might be seeing in those two strategies. That said, I don't think this is um, a divergence in any way. The United States, um, you know, outside of its Indo-Pacific strategy, has further work ongoing uh, to develop a very granular set of goals for the Indian Ocean. And quite to the contrary, I think this is an area in which we can think about relative mm -hmm. comparative advantage of the U.S. and EU and how we work together together to further those comparative advantages. So, um, you know, our EU colleagues have incredibly strong connections, diplomatic, security, um, and otherwise across the Indian Ocean region. Um, this maritime zone of interest is going to strengthen their presence further. Um, and as the United States and EU look to advance their strategies alongside each other, we should not just be looking to cooperate on projects together, but rather um, sometimes deconflicting or dividing and conquering the way that we're thinking about our comparative advantage in the region. And to the extent that the EU is putting a slightly heavier foot um, on the Indian Ocean, at least in its publicly stated strategy, I think that is very welcome and an opportunity um, for us to continue to advance our priorities in tandem. Absolutely. And it's also important to know the EU is working closely with with mutual partner India um, in the Indian Ocean region. So of course, that also fits in. Um, Gabrielle, to, to you on the question of um, concrete areas and projects where you see the potential of working with the United States. I noticed that the Indo-Pacific Ministerial Forum that happened last week in Paris, uh, the EU focused on three areas. There were roundtables on infrastructure connectivity, on global goods, and on security and defense. Um, are you also looking at potential projects in these three areas with the United States? Uh, could you elaborate a little bit more when, when we, for, for the audience that is interested in, you know, translating these strategies into concrete actions, um, as the EU likes to say, um, what are the areas that you see as high potential for working with the United States? Well, total convergence with Mira, actually, what she what she outlined are exactly the, the topics on which we decided to uh, start and strengthen our, our cooperations where we find more uh, food for, for work together. Um, if you allow me, then I would elaborate a little bit more on what Mira just said and linking it to, to, to Paris, of course. 
On maritime security, indeed, the coordinated maritime presence is uh, a big uh, innovation in terms of, uh, of defense policy of the EU. Uh, but here, uh, just let me stress once again that the EU does not have does not have a navy, an air force, or an army of its own. Uh, the EU can do what uh, her member states allow it to do. So uh, this is a, a clear and important difference because when we talk about the EU as such, uh, we have to bear in mind the competencies and the capacities that the EU has um, now. But on maritime security, what the EU can do at its level, uh, and we mentioned that in, in Washington, and we really have a lot of interest there, is to work a lot on the capacity building of our partners there. So on the local, on the local navies, on local coast guards, equipping them to be able to effectively monitor uh, the, uh, the, 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 the coast of the sea uh, in order to, to fight uh, illegal activities like illegal fishing or, or drug smuggling or even uh, immigration. Um, so that's uh, the capacity building of the local partners is important as well under maritime security. Then on infrastructure, of course, uh, when we talk about infrastructure, the connectivity, the global gateways, blue dot network, uh, well, this will be probably the backbone of, of, of the future actions in the, in the, in the Indo-Pacific. And here I would really like to underline how the blue dot network and the global gateways are very much alike. Both are based on a criteria which I would call bankability or long-term financial feasibility. So uh, both are based on a blending in of uh, public and private financing, a mix of grants and loans, but also with the involvement of financial institutions. And this is obviously a different way of seeing uh, infrastructure building or development uh, as compared to other uh, major players in the, in the, in the area. Um, in terms of high level standards that Mira mentioned, I would make it a little bit simpler. You mentioned 27 member states and, and many other actors, but uh, we uh, agreed that we would look mainly at the work which is happening in G7 and G20 on the, on the standards for, for, the, for the infrastructures of connectivity. Um, of course, climate change and resilience and answer to climate change, that is paramount. And this, if you want, mirrors what the internal priorities of the EU are. Uh, the EU gave itself a major, a major initiative in order to boost the green economy and to uh, get out of, of carbon use by 2050. And uh, obviously, uh, this has to be reflected also in the ex external action. So anything which is designed at uh, uh, fighting climate change and enabling the, the climate uh, uh, resilience is uh, uh, paramount to us. And we already discussed this. So also the link, for example, with the connectivity is clear here, the, the, the appropriate infrastructures but also uh, the means to uh, monitor and respond to uh, natural events or natural catastrophes is, is, is paramount. We even mentioned about the possible cooperation in the use of satellite technologies for this. Um, uh, that, and that would be extremely important because a rapid reaction to natural disasters is paramount to uh, minimize the effects on, on the affected populations. Um, Yes, uh, I, I think, uh, and then in Paris, uh, the three round tables were about this. One was, was about security, one was about connectivity, and one was about uh, global issues like, like climate change. So there have been other uh, more specific decision or topics, uh, but I would maybe keep it here, maybe stressing on maritime security, the value of international rules-based order and the uh, uh, importance that UNCLOS, the UN Convention on the Law of the Seas, has in, in order to uh, allow the, the Indo-Pacific to be uh, free and, and, and open. Um, I think, uh, I, think I, can, I, can, I can stop here. I mean, I would uh, also like to stress 
uh, how the uh, forum in Paris uh, was not only the first of its kind, so the EU and the Indo-Pacific partners at ministerial level, but it was a clear evidence of what you raised in your first question, Gaima. In the morning, we had the ministerial Indo-Pacific, and then in the afternoon, we had the immediate crisis meeting of the EU ministers of foreign affairs to discuss Ukraine. And this happened under the eyes of our partners. And this shows that the EU, allow me to say it, is a geopolitical actor and can deliver on different theaters at the same time. Um, yes. Yeah. Indeed. Um, I think it was commendable, remarkable that the Indo-Pacific Ministerial Forum went ahead um, despite the crisis uh, that was unfolding in Europe. And uh, it is also clear hearing uh, to both listening to both of you that you have been coordinating with the United States in parallel to the uh, ministerial forum, because it seems like there are lots of concrete uh, projects and, and ideas in the pipeline. Um, I, I have a question about structuring this cooperation and um, for, for very research. Enough. Sorry, very yes. enough. sorry to interrupt. Okay. I know I'm, I'm highly impolite and I don't respect the rules, uh, but sometimes no I, I like to be the bad guy. Uh, um, I would like here to, to underline one um, possible uh, element for cooperation that we raised as last in our, in our talks in, in Washington, but it's really close to my heart and it was really close to, uh, to Wendy's, uh, Wendy Sherman's uh, heart, I think. We discussed about joining efforts uh, in order to have an impact on people's life as well. And actually we discussed about the implementation of international labor organization standards and to particularly concentrate on the fight against child's labor, uh, which in the Indo-Pacific is endemic. And I think that if we are able to join forces, the US and the EU and its member states, I think we could make the difference for many people in the region as well. Sorry for, for having interrupted you, but uh, it's something I really care a lot for. That, that's fine. We have the rules-based order, but we have some uh, um, leniency in this uh, panel. Thank you so much. Uh, coming back to the, the question that I wanted to ask Mira about uh, structures is that um, for those of us observing developments in the Indo-Pacific, we see important conversations happening in forums like the Quad, but we also see a lot of the same topics being covered in the Trade and Technology Council, uh, the G7 was mentioned many times. Uh, we've all been talking about critical technologies, climate, resilient supply chains, etc. How do we make sure that these conversations are linked up? That because now the partners in the Indo Pacific are increasing in number, we don't end up duplicating or, at worst, undercutting each other and that um, Europe is sort of plugged in. How, how do we make sure that crucial coordination function um, takes place, which is increasingly difficult with, with minilaterals? Yeah, it, it's a great question, Garima, and I would say really an essential one uh, when it comes to implementation of the IPS for the United States. Um, I completely agree with you um, that there is a challenge here, um, you know, not only because we are trying to increasingly coordinate policies and strategies across two different regions um, where there are very few bodies that bring us together across those regions, but because there actually um, is not a central body for close allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific itself. Um, of course, the, um, there are many important regional organizations, ASEAN chief among them, um, which we see as central to the regional architecture. Um, but certainly when it comes to the United States working with its closest treaty allies, uh, it's aligned system started as a hub and spoke system. We are in many ways starting to evolve beyond that, layering new relationships on top of one another, connecting pre-existing relationships. The Quad is an example of that networking. Um, but there's no one venue in the Indo-Pacific that plugs all of our Asian allies and partners together, never mind connects them with our close allies and partners in Europe. Um, so there's frankly quite a lot of work to do there. 
Um, when it comes to, I would say in particular, global issues, um, like many of those that you just identified, um, you know, economic issues, uh, technology issues, supply chain issues. This is where we have to make essentially sure that these multilateral conversations are linked up, that the quad conversation is tracking with the TTC. Um, and that is, of course, because the conversations that we're having fundamentally impact one another when we seek to set norms and standards to govern these areas, right? They fundamentally cannot happen in regional vacuums. Um, so this is a place where I know the Quad would increasingly like to see, like to have the ability to invite like-minded partners to join Quad working group conversations on an informal basis, um, particularly in the critical and emerging technology space. Um, and I think we would also really welcome it um, if the TTC uh, wanted to invite the Quad to join uh, a meeting at some point um, on some of these norms and standards that tie us together. But of course, when it comes to issues that are more regionally specific um, and may involve a smaller number of partners, we're going to have to have those conversations through different venues. So if we're talking about maritime security in the Indian Ocean, that might be a US-EU conversation pulling in India and other regional partners uh, that have deep and abiding interests there. If we're talking about the Pacific Islands, we might be talking about a different um, group of highly interested and capable parties, including Australia and New Zealand. Um, so I do think we have to uh, be comfortable with the idea that we are going to be working across a huge variety of multilateral formats depending on the issue. And there's not going to be a single organizational solution um, to this vast issue set. But that does underscore another major issue that um, both of us have to think about as we seek to implement our strategies, which is the fact that when you pledge above all else to make your strategy contingent on allied and partner coordination, you are also pledging to do that coordination work on a regular basis and to build those structures and to sustain those conversations. And part of what we are doing with our EU partners now is building the channels through which we can focus our priorities and have those regular conversations. But that process is really just at its incipient stages. For us to really make progress in the Pacific Islands and Southeast Asia and on connectivity and in the maritime domain, we're going to really have to have an unprecedented level of working level coordination across the region on a sustained basis. And that is the charge in front of us. Great, thank you. Um, Gabrielle, same question for you, ch uh, channels of coordination. Uh, this um, high-level dialogue on Indo-Pacific, uh, which you have with the US, how regular would that conversation be? How often will that take place? And um, given that at the Indo-Pacific Ministerial Forum, the EU worked with a lot of its Indo-Pacific partners, how do you plan on bridging this, if I can borrow language from the US strategy, bridging the Euro-Atlantic and the Indo-Pacific? Yes, thank you. Uh, well, we, um, allow me to correct you, it's not a high level dialogue because that uh, implies working uh, groups and things. Uh, uh, we are consultations on the Indo-Pacific. It's, it's a rather agile uh, means of talking to each other. Uh, we have not decided yet uh, how often, uh, but we surely have decided that will be a follow up to what happened in Washington on the 3rd of December, 2021. I'm looking at Mira, but uh, I think that we are we are probably envisaging a meeting in Brussels in late spring, if I'm not wrong. So something between May or June. Uh, now, we have already started our actual, let's say, consultations, which are even practical and are at, a, if you want, a lower level than the one we had in Washington. Um, very humbly, Myself have established uh, bi-monthly calls with states, um, which I hope coordinate as well with with NIC and NSC. Um, we advance on the on items that we have identified, um, and we have also uh, demarched uh, all of our delegations. And the uh, uh, and the American side has demarched as well uh, its embassies in order to start uh, talks also locally in every country of the region so that the head of the EU delegation talks with the head or the responsible person of the American embassy 
in terms of Indo-Pacific cooperation and also locally, locally there is an identification of precise projects or avenues for cooperation because I think that, uh, uh, I mean, I think this was an idea which was taken over in December by our bosses uh, that this should be a two-tire approach. It should be bottom up, but also uh, uh, top down. So um, uh, what I mean with the top down, we have already done it. Uh, what we need in terms of bottom up is locally to have a bottom up. But the important issue here is not to get lost in details. So we don't have to wait until the whole exercise is completed, namely the mapping exercise of what we can or what we want to do in every country before starting actual implementation and actual projects uh, we don't have to lose ourselves in procedures, in talks, in confrontation, in red tapes, in drafting. Whenever we have a major initiative which we can put uh, in, in motion, then uh, we have decided that we should go, we should go ahead. It's, uh, after all, it's a matter of credibility. And as what I said at the beginning, uh, uh, here I echo it again. It's a, it's, a, it's a credibility of democracies and democracies also have to be able to show that they can deliver, uh, if not tomorrow, uh, not in 10 years. Great. Um, thank you so much, uh, Gabrielle. And a uh, final question uh, for you. Uh, the audience is interested, of course, in the China question, even though this panel is about Indo-Pacific strategies. Um, uh, there are a few folks in the audience who are interested if, if the EU has taken any lessons on dealing with China from, from the current crisis with, with Russia and what the um, EU sort of revised foreign security policy stands also for countries like Germany would mean on the China question. If you could share your thoughts on that, that would be very useful. Yeah. Well, uh... Let me just go a little bit back to what Mira said about the differences between us and the, and the, and the state. And one of the uh, very limited examples Mira gave was the uh, way uh, China is addressed in terms of language. It's true the language is a bit different, um, uh, but it's also true that both the US and the EU uh, apply a one China policy. Maybe, maybe uh, in, with, with some differences, but we both stick to a one China policy. Uh, of course, for the say obvious geopolitical reasons, the language is different, the interests at stake are different, but uh, let's say that the basic principles are there. Uh, the EU engages with China uh, since a couple of years uh, with a policy that we call the tripartite policy. Um, we see China as, at the same time, as a partner for global issues, as a competitor on economical issues, and as a rival for systemic issues. Um, and so I give you examples. Uh, we engage with China very, uh, let's say, uh, constructively uh, on, on the fight against climate change. So the COP26 in Edinburgh. So uh, a very good degree of cooperation between the EU and China and also the US. Um, of course, on economic issues, uh, China is, uh, a, ride, uh, is a, a competitor, uh, but a competitor is not something bad per se. A competitor who respects the rules and uh, respects the international rules-based order uh, is an acceptable competitor. It's a bit of a less acceptable when the rules are not respected, but that's, that's another story. And then finally, uh, a, a rival, a systemic rival. There are issues on which there, it's not possible to, to have uh, 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 compromises. So uh, the EU sanctioned China uh, entities and, and, and persons uh, for the non-respect of human rights uh, against Uyghurs or in Tibet or in Hong, in Hong Kong. And China retaliated. Uh, China sanctioned members of the European Parliament as well as the EU's ambassadors to the Political and Security Committee of the EU. So, just to tell you that the way we uh, uh, we deal with China is a little bit complex, but it is um, it is a very adult and pragmatic way of keeping what also the NSC said, keeping the channels open and uh, finding 
uh, way of mutual interest in, in, in talking and uh, to each other. Um, what have we learned from the Ukrainian story? I think that, uh, that uh, our approach to China as such is the good one. Um, I would like to see what will unfold in the next uh, days or weeks uh, in terms of China's attitude and behaviors towards Russia and towards the Ukrainian conflict, because already the fact that China abstained, abstained uh, both in the, in the Security Council and on the Ungar resolution, uh, well, it's, uh, it's uh, let's call it a non-total convergence with the Russia's position. Um, and, uh, and I think that uh, uh, will I will I would be tempted to say that uh, in the next days we will see even less of a convergence uh, on the on the Russia's position, uh, and I think that here uh, there is a lot of uh, interest in cooperating uh, with uh, with our partners uh, of old and of the, with the United States as well, and I think that uh, there could be there could be very interesting developments uh, ahead of us. And I don't know if Bonnie is still connected, but uh, I, I read her tweets uh, through the weekends and I have to say that I found them extremely interesting, uh, to put it bluntly. Thank you, excellent, thanks so much. Um, Mira, over to you, um, either on this topic or any closing remarks that you would have for us. Thanks so much. Um, you know, I would largely associate myself with many of uh, Gabriele's comments here, too. Obviously, um, you know, the United States shared its position on China in the Indo-Pacific strategy. The Indo-Pacific strategy is not our China strategy. Um, we have a uh, sort of comprehensive approach to China that has uh, domestic components, has international components, has allied and partner components. Um, and obviously, you know, as, as the president and, and much of our foreign policy leadership has said, this is increasingly an organizing principle of US foreign policy. Um, and we'll continue to have our full focus. Um, the Indo-Pacific is the front lines um, of everything we think about when we think about that competition with China, um, but it also matters very much in its own right and is critical to American and security prosperity in its own right. And that is why the Indo-Pacific strategy is um, largely its own document, a distinct document. Um, but the uh, question of China in this particular crisis, I think, is, as Gabrielle uh, signaled, very much an evolving one. Of course, before uh, Russia's invasion, we saw a fairly unprecedented joint statement between uh, China and Russia that signaled a degree of cooperation that we had not seen before from them. Um, as has since been publicly reported, there was a significant amount of diplomacy by the United States outreach to China in advance of Russia's war um, to ask Beijing and press upon Beijing the urgency of using its influence with Moscow um, to try to dissuade the conflict. Um, and that proved disappointing. And we are watching carefully now as Chinese officials um, make a variety of statements. Of course, um, they did abstain uh, from the UN Security Council resolution. There tends to be a fair amount of variation um, in the types of uh, statements that we are seeing on the international stage. Um, but I know that for all of our our allies and partners, this question of the proximity between Russia and China, not only on Ukraine, but much more broadly on issues of military, of intelligence, um, of economics is going to be front of mind, um, not just in the coming weeks, but for a very long time to come. Um, and that is true in Europe, and that is true in the Indo-Pacific. And part of the role that the United States will play is to um, try to share our best assessment and to keep our allies on the same page as we all work together to understand this evolution um, and what may be transpiring here. Um, but what I really want to conclude on is the relatively optimistic note on which we started, which is to say that for all uh, that we are being marred by this horrible war um, and tragedy in Ukraine, the extent of allied unity in Europe um, in the Indo-Pacific on behalf of Europe, um, and this interest in being deeply connected, um, not only in support of our respective Indo-Pacific strategies, but now uh, in support of an area in which Indo-Pacific allies were not previously engaged, did not previously see themselves as having vital interests, 
really does signal a sea change in the way that we are all seeing our interests um, in the world in this century and in this decade. Um, and I think we have very good reason to believe on the basis of what has taken place just in this last week, uh, that this is the beginning um, and certainly not the end of new levels of cooperation, not just amongst Europe, um, but cross regionally um, and among us all. And that is at a very dark hour, a very heartening thing to see. Um, and I know that we both feel privileged um, to get to play small roles and helping to support that as we carry it forward. Thank you so much, uh, both of you, for, for your openness and, and for sharing with us your thoughts. What I really take away from this conversation is that there's a lot of conversation and behind the scenes coordination already taking place between the United States and Europe. Um, I see Gabrielle has one final point, after which I'll hand over to Bonnie Glazer. Uh, Gabrielle, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, you asked the, the last takeaways to Mira, so I would like as well to have the right to have a last takeaway, uh, which is very much on the line of what you said, Mira. I think uh, that in these days, uh, we have really seen an incredible, incredible rally of partners, friends, allies in Europe, but all over the world. And I would like to underline the unprecedented level of convergence uh, to defend Western oriented or liberal democracies. I really insist on this because it's, it's paramount also for the Indo-Pacific. And uh, so it's obvious uh, the coordination that happened with the United States, but let me welcome immensely what Japan has done, what Korea has done, what uh, Australia has done. So uh, it's in the it's when uh, uh, support is needed, then you really see uh, countries which are uh, not just talking, but are uh, uh, acting uh, like partners, friends, or, or allies. So again, the relevance of what happens in Europe is paramount in the Indo-Pacific as well. Indeed, thank you. Uh, Bonnie, over to you. Thank you, uh, Gabriella and, uh, and, and Mira. This has just been a fantastic uh, conversation. Um, and it really does uh, reflect how much commonality there is between the US and the EU, um, obviously not just in Europe and in responding to this crisis and Russia's invasion in, in Ukraine, uh, but going forward in, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and and our, our discussion uh, in both of our panels really, I think is, has really underscored uh, once again uh, that the strengthening of US and EU cooperation uh, is taking place in very tangible, crucial ways, uh, both in Europe and the Indo-Pacific. And even as the attention of the United States and its allies are necessarily and understandably uh, focused today on Ukraine, uh, I believe that the Indo-Pacific will remain a priority in our strategies. Uh, and we will all be watching closely as our respective Indo-Pacific strategies, which both of you have played such an instrumental role in developing, um, are implemented. So finally, let me say uh, that as an organization dedicated to the transatlantic relationship, we at GMF um, are seized with this crisis uh, in Ukraine. We stand with the Ukrainian people in defense of their liberties, and we hope that peace returns to their country um, as soon as possible. So thank you again for joining us.